Notice is here by given that the meeting that a meeting of the Salem City Council Committee on Government Services Wednesday, May 18th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. for the purpose of discussing a petition from Alan Hanscom requesting no vendors on the Salem Common via remote participation in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and as amended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022. Subcommittee meetings are held to take action on the purpose for the purpose of making recommendations to the full council. Individuals may participate remotely in the meeting via a remote participation platform called Zoom. Members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend the meeting may access the remote via remote participation through any one of the following ways. Please click the link below, password 205-366 or telephone, webinar ID 810-7097-0925. Every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by a technological means in the event that we are unable to do so matters not requiring a public hearing. We will post the city of Salem's website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Persons requiring auxiliary aids and services for effective communication such as sign language interpreter or assisted, an assistant, assistive li listening device or print material in digital format or a Reasonable modification in program services, policies, or activities may contact the City of Salem ADA coordinator at 978-619-5630 as soon as possible and no less than two business days before the meeting program or event. Agenda, petition from Alan Hanscom to requ requesting no vendors on the Salem Common. Uh, before we get, get started, um, wanted to note that uh, in accordance with Section 31, Appointment of Committees, all committees shall be appointed by the president unless otherwise provided the chairperson of a committee may appoint a member of the city council as a temporary member of said committee when the absence of a quorum would cause a duly posted committee meeting to be canceled, postponed, adjourned. Said temporary appointment may not remain in effect beyond adjournment of the committee meeting. So what we have here is uh, two members of the, the, the standing committee that are present, myself and Councillor Watson Felt. Um, three members were not able to, to make the meeting, unfortunately. Um, by a section 31, we are able to appoint a temporary fill-in from the city council, and that is Councilor Mer Merkel, who is being deputized here tonight. So uh, Councilor Merkel, it's just tonight. You were just on government services for one night, um, but she agreed to yes. jump in and join, and join the council, and uh, that, that will be noted in the public record. Uh, President, we have Councilor Watsonfelt and Councilor Merkel. Absent, we have Councillor Varela, Cohen, and McLean. We also have Ellen Talkowski, Darlene Mellis, Ray, uh, Ray Jadoin, Dave Knowlton, uh, Trish O'Brien, and Darlene Mellis. So uh, what we're here today to, to do is discuss uh, a petition to not have events on the, on the, on the uh, common in the, in the year of 2022. And I think this is also a great opportunity for the city to, I know as, as many of us know, the city has been looking at things that happened last year, things that went really well, things that we could do differently. Um, and there's some plans in place to maybe make some adjustments this year. So I think it's a great opportunity for folks to discuss what that will look like. So I guess before we do that, the petitioner here is Alan Hanscom. He's joined us. Alan, if you want to just take a couple minutes to just discuss your end of it, and then we'll we'll kick it off to city officials. Yeah, I, I just have um, a short thing I, um, I've written up um, explaining explaining this a little better. So um, I've lived near the common since 1995, and I've never seen so much damage to the grass on the west side of the common as after October 2021. There was just too much foot traffic every single day for the whole month. And, and that also was unique to, to um, never having happened before that much foot traffic. The layout of the rides and of the vendor tents actually didn't do as much damage to the grass as the foot traffic itself did. Um, this included the busy concert schedule on the bandstand that month too. There was not a blade of grass left right up to the edge of the bandstand. As you can see in my background, um, I show there's the before and after. The, the criticism I got from complaining about this was that the grass would be replanted in the spring. However, all fall and winter, those of us who use the common year round had to put up with a muddy mess. 
since there was no winter dried turf to absorb the rain and snow. I am very pleased with the restoration being done right as we speak to restore the grass. And, and actually at the Parks and Rec meeting last night, I was, um, I, I, I learned something new. The reason grass has never grown well in the very far west of the common is because of the abundance of Norway maples there. They're actually toxic to ground cover. And, and that's, so that's another issue. Um, that was according to Naomi Cottrell, who was doing the evaluation of future tree plantings on the common. Very, very um, knowledgeable. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that we need to reevaluate allowing too much foot traffic on the common for an entire month. <clears throat> the grass is done fine with events that are only a weekend long in, in years past, actually. Been doing that for a long time. Um, I can also, I can provide a link for how Washington, D.C. restored beautiful grass to the acres of the National Mall by delegating certain activities to hardscape or paved areas, and also their um, special rehabilitation of the grassy areas. And finally, my hope is that we won't spend a fortune every spring fixing the damage from the October before, um, like a vicious cycle. The common belongs to all of the people of Salem to take care of. And Salem Common is older than the National Mall. I just got my typing here. Um, I guess I'll kick it to, I don't know who, who would want to be first. Just to, I'm sorry, Alan, are you? Yeah, I'm all set. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Um, Ellen, do you want to, do you want to talk through some of the, I know you were part of the, the group that looked at uh, the way things went last year, things that you'd like to do differently this year. Do you want to sort of talk through some of that? Um, sure. Um, I guess I'm, I apologize, Alan, real quick before, before I, I kick it over to you, does anyone have any questions for Alan? Okay. Sorry, Alan, go ahead. No, that's okay. Okay. I don't know um, if it's um, better for um, Trish or David to talk about some of the things. Do you, Trish, do you want me to? Yeah. You're on mute. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me this evening. Um, as Alan mentioned, we had a, a great meeting last night with the Park and Rec Commission approving um, some restoration of uh, specific trees uh, in various parts of the park that um, that go along with Naomi's landscape design, um, along with a kind of a, a couple of larger trees a little further back. Um, and we were also able to do a lot of uh, tree pruning this year, um, uh, leading up to the, the muster. Um, and uh, fortunately having uh, gotten some grant funding from some earmark grant funding from the state, uh, we've been doing improvements to the common uh, for a couple of years now. Um, last year, we added um, uh, accessible entryways at uh, various points to the common. Um, we were able to purchase new benches, including accessible benches, um, and those were installed. Um, we have new uh, replacement trash cans, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but they're actually pretty expensive coming in uh, this spring. Um, Dave, Knowlton, Ray, Joden, Ellen, myself, um, have worked really hard to um, plan for the future and, and address some of these concerns. Um, with some of the Airmark funding, uh, we, will, we will have a chance to do that. Um, we've done some uh, research on some pa uh, protective padding that can uh, be put on top of the grass along the edges of the pathways which is a kind of a temporary assist, um, but also movable according to where the areas are that we might need to protect. Um, you know, I'd like to give a shout out a little bit to our, our parks crew and our DPW because although um, 
public service isn't easy. I have to say a lot of times, it, and Facebook makes it brutal, uh, being brutally honest, it's tough um, when something throw, you know, gets thrown on Facebook, um, you know, the day after an event sometimes where um, we haven't been able to address it. Uh, and it, and it, is, it is a challenge, um, but we, we do get to it. And, and I have to say, I think our, our crew does a, does a really nice job. Um, but hopefully uh, with some of these other measures um, that, that we talked about, um, also widening the pass a little bit and having some turn radiuses that may prevent uh, damage to the grass. Uh, as Alan mentioned, um, what Naomi talked about with the, the, the trees and the tree coverage and the type of trees that doesn't really lend itself to grass in the uh, entryway to the, the common where the Hawthorne Hotel is. We are looking into uh, actually hardscaping some of that area, extending some of the stone dust and the, uh, I keep calling it cobblestone. I don't know exactly what it is, but in that center, center walkway um, going into the veterans mo uh, monument. Um, so that is something that's on the city's uh, agenda to, to move forward and, and try to address as well. Um, in addition to the, the tree cover, uh, also it's, it's a lot of shade. So it is hard to grow grass uh, in that area. And, and it is compacted um, in that front area where the traffic is. So it does make sense to hardscape some of that area. That's um, a little overview. Th and thank you. Um... If I could ask, just on the um, on the hardscapes, there is is the plan to add some vendors to that hardscape at the front, or is the plan just to is just to cover up the dirt, understanding that grass won't won't grow there likely. I'm sorry. Did you say add add ven add vendors? Yeah. Yeah. Is the, is the plan to move some of the vendors to that added hardscape, or is that uh, is that just to account for the fact that grass won't be growing there likely? Yeah, I mean, I think it could be both, right? I mean, while it's hardscaped, it would be it would make a lot of sense to um, utilize that space and not not um, have as many on, on the grass. I so guess that I guess, may, be, may be a question for Ellen. I apologize, um, but just just curious what the thinking on that was. If it was just to um, just to cover up that section, or if it was to give more space for vendors to be in areas that weren't on the grass or on the dirt. Um, I know Trish, Trisha's right. I, I think it's it's both, but um, some of the areas are already utilized by vendors. Um, so those, those spaces we're looking at hardscaping. Um, so, um, because we can't, we can't grow grass there. And actually, Alan, from you, I just learned tonight <laughs> about the, uh, no way maples and the, uh, um, why it can't grow grass. So those are areas and, and um, most not all of them, but most of them in the front um, are being utilized um, already. Um, I think it, it'll just make it, um, it will just make it um, more uniform and uh, so they can, um, they can use it without, um, without having to worry about grass or damaging grass. Uh, Councilor Merkel. Thank you, Chair Hapworth. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I, th I think that sounds like a, a really good plan to utilize some of the area that the grass won't grow, come up with a new plan for it, and then, you know, gear the vendors, you know, that obviously they're not all going to fit there, but um, just to kind of reconfigurate uh, to the areas where the grass isn't growing, I think that sounds great. Uh, I'd love to know a little bit more about the protective padding. Is it uh, is it expensive? Is it practical? Uh, uh, I, I'm not very knowledgeable about it, so I'd love to hear about that. Thanks. Yeah, Ray can share some information on that. So, so we looked at a, a product um, that is actually from Forestry Supply. It's about a three uh, foot by six foot clear mat. Um, so these, what these are, these are translucent uh, truck mats that will allow the sun to permeate to the grass. So it, it really does, it kind of lays on top of it like a piece of plywood. So it kind of distributes the weight evenly, but it doesn't kill the grass underneath it. In fact, they've supposedly had studies um, that you can leave the, the uh, protection mat down for five days and it doesn't kill the grass underneath it. So that's kind of the direction that we're kind of looking at for these pads. These pads are coming in roughly about uh, $244 a, uh, a, a unit. So they are kind of pricey. Um, so we're looking at picking up roughly about 160 of them 
which would come in roughly about $39,000. And with freight, we're probably looking at close to about $41,000 for about 160 pads uh, that are these translucent pads. Ty, if I could share my screen. We, we yes, do please. A graphic. Right. Thanks, Deborah. that's really interesting. Uh, 360, okay. Bear with me. Can everyone see that? Yes. So some of the, the improvements that we're um, looking into right now and, and we're, we're pricing things up is the mats that, that Ray was just talking about. And those are showing green here. They're, they're flexible. They can be laid you know, next to each other to get it wider or um, in one long strip, depending on what the, uh, what the use is gonna be. So it could be wider if there's no, no vendors. <clears throat> um, it would it'd make a wider path for people to walk on. Or if there's vendors, we could double them up and make a bigger area for carts or trucks or whatever to park on the grass. So we, we have enough to cover these different areas. Uh, we're thinking that these intermediate paths <clears throat> around the bandstand would, would benefit from those, those pads um, and also uh, a way to get across the grass to the bandstand itself for those um, events that um, you know, need a truck to deliver something for to the bandstand for, for use. So it's either gonna be something like this that's shown or maybe it's in this direction. But we're also looking at there, there's co existing concrete paths right now that run kind of bisect the uh, the common. This one here is the longest, it's about 600 feet long. And there's another one that's here. And we're looking to, to widen those. Right now they're five feet wide. So what happens is you get large trucks and you know the the, the truck wheels. You maybe you get lucky if you get one truck, one one tire on the concrete, but the other one's out in the grass. And I think that's what we saw last October when we had some pretty heavy rains. And we saw some of the damage that was done um, at that time. But what we're proposing is to do a 12 foot wide path in concrete. So we remove the existing path and make this 12 feet wide. So you could easily get a truck on there. And you know, a, a typical truck is eight, nine feet wide. Um, then there still would be space for pedestrians to go by as well if they're walking. So we wanted to try and accommodate both of those activities. Obviously, if trucks are going through, it's going to you'll have to go slow and make sure that they're not uh, impeding anyone that, that's walking, but um, <clears throat> it would go from the entrance here on Washington Square North, all the way down to Washington Square South. And we would also put concrete in these circles, probably an inverse curve to allow for the trucks to turn to get on these paths if needed at these, these three locations. So protect the, the, the grass a little bit more. And then this also gives us an opportunity to potentially have some one-way traffic. You know, we could have trucks entering in this direction, either coming down to the main path or over here and then exiting at this location. So that may help with the uh, food trucks when those, uh, when those come in, just to not have them turning around on the grass, depending on which side the, uh, the doors open up to um, for the trucks themselves. So we're looking at, uh, uh, these two locations, it's a total of about a thousand feet long. And then this is the area where we'd look, be looking to do some of the hardscaping stuff. And you know, we haven't really fully cooked that yet. It's not, we're not sure if it's gonna be stone dust or, or cobbles or some something in between. But we'll have to figure that out. What is the, the cross hatched section there? I think it's the, the yeah, right there. That would be the proposed was, stone dust. The stone dust area. Got it, okay. Up to this path here, and that's again that's the area that's under the trees that typically doesn't get any growth, and and uh, grass, and there's no irrigation there either, which further um, limits the ability to get grass growing in there. And uh, going back to the mats, Ray had mentioned that it, they last for five days, or or for five days without killing the grass. Is that like five days straight with them just down and not and not coming up? I mean. Yeah. I that's that's correct. So they would do, they would these would come up each night. Is that how that would work each time the um, vendors go home, or how how would we have those out there? 
I, I think that's still kind of being discussed on how to implement that. Um, so I think it's kind of early, depending on uh, again programming. I think I think the idea was to sit there and understand what impacts the the events are going to have and lay the mats down to protect the, the area as long as we need to and not fear that the grass was going to be harmed because of it. I can, I, let me see if I can find a picture for you. Darling, while he's pulling that up, did you have a question? You're, uh, you're muted right now. So it seems to me that the big events really are longer than five days. Where do these um, um, transparent um, uh, liners get stored? It seems like a, a lot of put down, a lot of take up. Why not just do a permanent uh, path expansion? I think it's really, it's cost and it's flexibility. You know, if we get these, get these pads, we can move them around and we'll just have to work with whatever event's gonna happen um, and, and make sure that we can accommodate them, make sure that they're useful. Well, Ellen, how long do these events usually go on? I, it seems to me that you know, they can be longer than five days fairly frequently. The August events, yeah. the October events. We, we go weekend by weekend, but I mean, there's the answer to that. Um, so, um, you know, that, that would cover that. In, um, dependent some of it is also weather dependent um you know if we have um drier you know drier days so to speak um you know they that they might not even need to be used um but i think that um they, they're in response to if the soil gets a little bit soft and um, i think that's going to make a huge difference and um i David, as David also said, there are different events in different places um, and, and we can use these. I mean, we can lay them all out together and, you know, fill in an entire, you know, an entire section, you know, if we needed to put, um, you know, for example, um, when we have um, Public Safety Day and the police um, bring in some of, um, some of their command vehicles and things like that. Um, you can you can move them and use them in in another section. Um, could, uh, is um, Bobby Blank going to be brought in on this? Because um, I know it sounds simple just to put down stone dust, but if the soil in which the maple trees are growing is already as hard as concrete, uh, and then you're going to finalize it, but it's definitely a hard finish with the stone dust. Um, Maybe you should be thinking about aerating it before you finalize it. Um, Ray, I believe that is yeah, part, so I, part of the plan, and yeah. we will be talking to Bob also. Yeah, thank you, Darlene. I, I appreciate it. So we'd be looking at taking the same approach that we would be look, we did out down the willows to try to protect the trees, but at the same time trying to provide that hardscaping for the programmable space. I think the idea is to try to protect the trees that are already established as much as possible but also trying to create an area of hardscaping that kind of is a dual purpose. Sure. So, so, so I, I think that that's what we'll be looking at. Are you going to be putting a circle of mulch around the trees so that they definitely collect water during rain and it gets down into the roots? I think that we need to talk to Bob, like we said, and make the best decision for the, for the location, whether it be putting mulch, whether it be permeable, um, I think it's something that we need to meet and discuss to finalize the plan, but that, that's our idea is to protect both the trees and, and hardscape with both. Yeah, the answer is yes, Darlene. Bob is always involved in as a uh, consultant on any work that involves trees. Okay, great, thanks. I think, I don't see the hand. I think Council Watsonfield had a question. And you're muted as well. Of course I am. Um, thank you, Chair Hapworth. I actually have a number of questions and we'll take them a few at a time, a couple at a time. Um, one of the things I have, so some questions with regards to these pads uh, for Ray and David. Um, how do these function 
with mud or when there's a, an increase or sort of last year we got a bit of a deluge of water over the course of a number of back-to-back -back days which caused um, muddy conditions and I think one of the one of the learnings last year was like you know it was dry when the tires went on and then it rained for a whole bunch of days and everything turned to mud and started to sort of sink and then they couldn't get out of there and like now we have that's part of why we had those large divots um, and I'm, I'm wondering if these will, if, if they will still do their job in, in circumstances like that. Um, and then also what makes these better than those, um, you know, the other product that I've seen is those hexagonal um, sort of tracts that you put down that are open, but, but spread way evenly as well. Are these better for a certain kind of vehicle or you know they last longer or they're like how how what differentiates this product from that from the other kinds of products out there are you talking about the um the geo grid that actually gets put down yeah, you know you have to excavate and you put it down and then the grass grows through it and you can drive on it yes yeah <clears throat> we did look at that we just thought that these mats you know would be just give us more flexibility depending on the space that's being used. We can double them up, triple them up if, if needed. So it's it just a, a flexibility of, of installing and use. Uh, we, you know, we did we did consider those geo grids. It, it is expensive and that's a, a cost. It is kind of a permanent thing. This this gives us that flexibility of, of being able to do different things in the area. So just to clarify, um, the geo grid would be a permanent installation? The ones that I've seen, yeah. You actually have to dig out like three or four inches of gravel of, of the uh, loam. You've got to put a base of stone underneath it. Then you put the geo grid in and then you put you put the uh, planting material back in and then the grass grows grows up through that. And then you just mow it. <clears throat> and you could just, it's just something that can be driven on. And it does the same thing. It just spreads the weight of the tires, the point load from the tires across an area. So you don't get that, you know, the depression, you don't get the sinking of the, uh, of the tires. But these things so, do this. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Did you have more to say? No. Nope. Okay. I guess my follow-on question then would be, um, why not make them a permanent installation? <laughs> I, I, I still have I still have questions around why why the suggested pads are a better product. Um, when you say flexibility, can I can you help me understand that a bit better? Flexibility for what purpose? For being able to um, use the space a little better. Let me. Come back. Can you see the back of this screen? Yep. With the plan. So <clears throat> we don't necessarily have to just put them along a, a line along the path to make it a wider path. We could stack them up and we could just fill in a whole area so that the entire area could be driven on, could be, you know, walked on. Uh, where it, with the geo grid, it would be very expensive to install a geo grid along the entire in that entire area. And then the geo grid would impact the um, the irrigation system that we have there as well, the water boxes and the uh, the sprinkler heads that pop up, we have to make accommodations for those. So it's just, it, we'll see. You know, th this mat process seems seems like it's going to work. We, we're fairly confident it will, and it does give us that flexibility. But maybe you know, after a year or two, we decide maybe we do need to go the geo grid. It's just going to be a more cost to have to excavate the entire area, install it, and then reseed it. <clears throat> So we think this is a good first step. Okay, that's that's really helpful. That's a really helpful answer, especially with regards to the um, irrigation system um, and the the size of the space that's used. And I think that we all agree we want flexibility in our ability to use the various different spaces. It's a large area. Um, we wouldn't want to geogrid the whole place. So I, I think that that's helpful. That's been a helpful answer. A couple more questions, Chair Hapworth, if it's all right with you. Yes. I continue. Thank you. Um, so just an answer on how the pads work with regards to mud surfaces and additional sort of unforeseen storms and water and all that kind of stuff. I don't think there, there's going to be an issue if, if there's mud, if it's a muddy area. Again, you're still dispersing the weight of the tires, so you still should be able to drive on it. One, one of the things we have been talking about is <clears throat> to have like an inclement weather plan and talk about it with the uh, event managers. The, the people that are in charge of whatever equipment and materials are going to be brought onto the uh, onto the common, <clears throat> which I don't think we had last year. I think we really need to um, tighten that up. And if there is, you know, heavy rains forecasted, 
then we need to talk with them and make sure that they understand <clears throat> where they can go, where they can't go, and that they have to use these, you know, make sure that the mats are there. Um, that's kind of the plan to, you know, moving forward, we'll, we're gonna tighten that up and, and just make sure that there's better communication between city staff and, and the, uh, the vendors that come onto the mall, uh, onto the common. And I guess so a follow on question there would be, would the vendors be allowed or expected even to put any um, of their long-term wheeled uh, vehicles or mechanics on these pads for the duration of their full event? Would there be like any additional charge to them for sort of renting them from the city or if in case of damage or anything like that? And then following on just to Darlene's question around, you know, for, for, you know, generators or, you know, um, vans or whatever might be there longer than, than the five days in the month of October, you know, is, is there any evidence that these will still do their job in protecting the area after, um, you know, if more than five days and with a lot of rain, like in the very worst case scenario. <laughs> I think, you know, the, the manufacturer's information talks about, you know, no, no grass damage after five days. You know, we got to think that this is still in October, so the grass is kind of dying out. It's the end of the season, so the, you know the, the grass damage should be minimal. You know, using these these mats, um, we'll just have to work with the vendors and, and make sure they understand what we're what we're proposing and what we're trying to protect. Um, I can't speak to uh, cost sharing. I, I don't know if we've gotten that far with with that as far you know with vendors. I know I think there's a fee when they use the common that that and some of that money. Is returned to the city, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure Trish may know or, or Ellen may know a little better than I do. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead, Trish. I was going to say, you know, we, we haven't got that far in terms of do we want to pass that on to them, make it part of the contract. Um, but we do have a common revolving fund that we do uh, collect some money from from these events. So that does go into that actually I just printed it out uh, today. There's like 40,000 in that account right now. So I may be coming to council to, to use that money for some of the stuff uh, as we speak. So, um, but that, you know, that does, um, that is a fund that has been built up for uh, something just like this to be able to put back into the common. And it's specifically for that. That's great. My next set of questions is specifically about fees um, and funds and how the funds work. So that's a great transition. Um, currently, I'm, I'm just curious if I could better understand what the, what the fees are for use of the common right now and if it makes sense to look at um, if there's going to be, like, you know, not all events are, as Ellen knows very well, not all events are built equally, right? And so some have a much more taxing effect on the space than others. And I'd be curious if there, if, if the Park and Rec Commission has thought at all or considered additional potential um, fees around any, you know, to help offset maintenance or damage costs or anything like that, just with regards to large, really, really large vendors. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to hurt any local small businesses or nonprofit organizations who I know really utilize the common on a regular basis, but I would be curious about if there is an opportunity for anything larger. Um, have you guys discussed that at all, Trish? Um, so <clears throat> typically the applications that come to us are, are a little bit more of the smaller ones. Um, yeah. Although they, you know, the demand is getting higher. Um, they're not the large, the larger events, the larger. So those events uh, come through us. We, we did, um, we do have a $25 vendor fee that we're beginning to charge them now um, that will go into this account or we did last year. Uh, with the larger events, they usually go out to like the RFP pro. Oh, sorry. And on the application, it does say, you know, the city could require blah, blah, blah. So oftentimes when they do come to the commission, um, there is discussion about trash. We ask them to pick up um, after themselves. I mean, we don't, we, ha we don't actually have, or at least since I've been here and I think beyond haven't actually charged a trash fee. Oftentimes we make them get porta potties and things like that. Um, I'm sure it could be it could be looked at. Um, again, it's the balance of of wanting to have um, and accommodate a lot of these nonprofits and some of these these traditional events that have happened every year, and not um, not make it unfeasible, but uh, also take care of the city. So 
Um, I mean, since I've been here, we've we've incorporated the five percent um, for any for any up, not necessarily on the common, but like road races and things like that that we've turned into a revolving fund as well. So I think it's open to. It says right on application they may ask you for um, for a fee for trash. So it could be something we could look at. And then the larger events Ellen can talk to, but a lot of those will go out to um, to an RFP process, or the city is is asking uh, for people to apply. Uh, so Ellen, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, um, yeah, I can I can speak to October, um, just in general. Um, we there actually what happened in October and why some of the vendors got moved last year. Um, is because um, we learned a lot of things during COVID and one of them was not having vendors on the mall, obviously no one was on the mall, um, you know, made it easier and opened it up and it wasn't as, um, as gridlocked with people. Um, so that is why the vendors are on the mall. But these are city, these are city events. The city goes out for, um, request for proposals for people to manage these events, but they are our city events. So there's a manager of the Food Truck Festival, there's a manager um, of the vendors in the mall. Um, so, and we realize obviously that there is wear and tear. Um, you know, we have to balance that with um, using the common, um, you know, as, as an open space and to, to to draw people around the whole city itself um, is that um, we want we wanted them here. Um, that's one of the reasons um, that we um, that we kind of went to this model of people um, managing our vendors. Um, so things like that. October is huge, but a huge part of it is um is our city our city events um you know there are other events that um you know are bigger in nature um and interestingly like one is pride um and that's a nonprofit so um it's a little bit of a balance you know we haven't had someone come in that you know wants to you know utilize the whole common you know we we're asking them to you know cover all these costs um so a lot of the events we see are truly non nonprofit events in the common or city mandated events. Um, that how we plan for Halloween. Yeah, I think you know one of the comments I'll make follow on to that, Ellen, is that I think it's a good model, right? We subcontract all the time for all kinds of services, and I think that having a subcontractor vendor to manage large scale events for the city, you know follow suit with every other large third party vendor we contract for major important services that we're not otherwise able to accommodate, um, which includes like data collection on parking and traffic and like all kinds of things right. Um, so I think the model is a good one and I, and that's actually encouraging to hear that this that, that these are city events because it means then we can invest in things like these these pads or tracks or whatever we end up deciding is the right thing to do and expect that and and can expect that they would be utilized the right way to the best to our standards right which I think is important um, is an important takeaway so that's a great answer um the only the other, other part I, can I, I'm sorry I'm sorry yeah, no, go I ahead. just wanted no, to no. piggyback on that but go ahead and ask your question first no my next question is just one more finance question but so you go ahead before we move on from this no I forgot what I was going to say <laughs> So you know it where happens, to find me, Ellen. That you know happens to find a me. lot. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. I do know what I wanted to say is actually um, we do even, even we understand they're city events, but we do understand there is some wear and tear. Um, so there, uh, there are numbers built into the RFPs that are going to go back directly into the product maintenance fund. Right. That's great. Thank you. Um, so with regards to these, um, 244 per unit times 160 units for a total of approximately 41,000, including freight. Um, would that come from the earmarked state funds? Okay, so so that's no. already been. Oh, it I would don't not think. Come. I don't think so. I I think Trish needs to decide that, but I think it might come out of the actual common maintenance fund. 
Got it. Yeah, I've never I think seen it makes yet. more sense because um, because technically they are movable, so they could be used at a different park. And where the earmarks are very specific to the common, that earmark money should be spent for any of the permanent solutions. So uh, widening the path at the common would be a permanent solution. Hardscaping would be a permanent solution. So I think the ARPA dollars would be focused on the permanent solutions there. That's great, Trish. I love that you um, you basically teed up the opportunity that these get used at other parks, right? So so I, I love the idea that, that this has started a conversation about how we care for our, our parks that are utilized heavily you know, throughout the city, which it will include the new Willows coming soon and the new Forest River work and all of that. So that's great. Yeah. Um, Councillor Hapworth, that's, that's, those are all my questions so far. Thanks for your patience. Well, thank you. Uh, Alan, I know you've had your hand up for a little while. Um, just two quick points. And that is, um, I, I really um, want to emphasize, it was the month long exposure to foot traffic that was the most damaging. And that can be seen, if you look in my background, um, there's the bandstand um, and it's all the grass is gone. And that was from the concerts, you know? So anyway, I mean, tire marks were bad too. And I'm glad to hear about that, some ideas for that. However, I just, this is not my um, specialty by any means, but, don't forget the all that has to be approved by other commissions, historic commission. So sidewalks, I think, are really old, and you know. So just I, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm just going to say that probably it needs to be run by even maybe even a mass Massachusetts historic um, agency. And that's all. I just wanted to make those two points. Darlene? So what we notice for trees, it's uh, having people in large numbers might be an issue, but most of the time they're distributed. And uh, I heard that um, sometimes the vendors uh, deliver their goods instead of in trucks, in carts, which then go to a tent. And all that usage is much less kind. Um, much less harsh on the soils, et cetera. Uh, are you ever going to work your way towards not having trucks on the common at all? Are you thinking about that? Is that a possibility? It's not truly feasible to have so many vendors um, try to load in and load out with, with all their goods um, to hand carry. Um, I mean, we, I, you know, we've had some of those discussions um, before, I mean, it makes a difference, you know, if there's only 20 vendors or something like that, but to get everybody up in, in and out um, and get full blown open um, with in this, in the particular case of October, um, isn't necessarily feasible. And there are just, I mean, some things that, you know, have to, have to get trucked in, um, you know, when, you know, if people set up huge, you know, um, huge tents or, um, you know, many, many tables and chairs and, and things like that. Um, so if it's something that's small enough, you know, and it's in a location where um, it's easy enough to truck things in and out, um, you know, we will, you know, we would do that. Um, but for October, um, with, with so many vendors um, that, um, that really isn't feasible for us to do. Thank you, Ellen. Um, before we move to Councillor Merkel, just on that question, um, are vehicles, how, how are we determining the, ve determining the vehicles are even allowed on the common? Just, I know that our ordinances say that no driving or parking of vehicles on the Salem common. How does that, does that uh, work with, with the events or how does that, I'm just curious on that point. There, I, my understanding is there are two permits that are given for short-term park and long-term parking for the common. Um, and I usually make them and I make permits for lots of different things, but um, 
we've had permits for people in the common, um, people outside the common, um, and um, you know, people that you know park on the outside. Um, so that that's my that's my understanding. Um, so your your view on that would be that the um, the generally all year long those are not vehicles are not allowed on the common, but if we have a permit situation, then we're able to to do that. Trish, I believe so. Right? Yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, there's not supposed to be random cars driving through the common. Um, the city vehicles, if they're maintaining the trash or doing you know out there doing work, and then if there is a permanent event there. Um, the requests should be on the permit or or asked of say our commission would say do you you know do you need do you need to have trucks i mean we've tried to avoid it for any small events and we say can you have the tent you know if it's a wedding and they're they're in conjunction with the hawthorne you know is it, is it possible for them to wheel them in and depending on the size they'll do it but if if uh if it's a larger sized event, it's like Ellen said, it's kind of not really feasible. So, um, so they are they are allowed with. I think you said it correctly, with a permitted event with permission, they are allowed, but not you know. Other than that, there shouldn't be random cars in there. And we, I, I, um, when I patrol, um, you know, it's definitely you know. This, you know, you need to leave right after you're done with this, or you know, you can't stay here, or um, you know, what, you know, whose car is this? Um, you know, especially when there's a lot of different things going on um, to to kind of keep track of it. Um, so we try to be as diligent as we can, um, if, you know, if I'm on site. And and I I also I think Ellen also I remember being involved in the food truck meeting maybe two years ago where. You know, we made it really clear you're not coming and going with those trucks if you're coming to this festival you're staying you're coming in once and you're parking and you're staying you're not leaving uh you know overnight to go restock or to do whatever that that has to be done outside of the common to, to mim minimize the back and forth uh come and go of the events yeah we actually i believe trish um also um scale down the number of trucks um to make um to make um, it more feasible, um, and also um, due to some of the um, some of the tree trimming, actually on the I, I never know which side of the common is which. Um, um, on I'm going to say the, the Pleasant Street side, um, we can actually we're going to look at taking some of the trucks in on that side and having them just stay on the perimeter path. Um, um, that will that will let them have their access windows um, on the right side. Um, some of them coming in through um, what I say is the main vehicle entrance um, on the north side. Um, some of that um, there was was some turning around stuff, and we're going to actually see um, if we can get trucks through with the um, trees trimmed from the other entrance. So so that will be a little bit more helpful too. Um, and I, I'll get over to uh, Councilor Merkel here, and I, I do want to come back to uh, trees at some point here in the near future, and then by 7.25, 7.30, we'd love to move on to co public comment if we're able to, just want to give everyone sort of a time check where we're at. Uh, Councilor Merkel. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I just want to uh, say a couple of the ideas uh, that I support. I, I think it makes total sense to widen a couple of the paths uh, in, in the common, you know, to accommodate larger vehicles. I, I think the uh, inclement weather plan is really a good idea. I mean, there's always certain weather circumstances that you're going to get the perfect storm, <laughs> no pun intended, that's going to cause the most damage. Uh, and so I, I think that's really a good thing to look at. Uh, and uh, so I thought that was a great idea. And I also want to say I, I appreciate you all being uh, mindful of you know what vendors we get that we do have our nonprofits we do have our small artists and so striking a balance i volunteer on the common in october for a nonprofit here in salem that benefits our community so i i do appreciate um you know keep keeping that in mind as well thank you thank you council merkel um and I'll, before we move on to the trees I, I would add just i guess I, just as a thought that the 
the if we do ever decide to you guys hear me okay right now i'm sorry yep. I'm getting a notice that my internet connection is dropping um is that that if we do decide to ever actually widen those paths it would be a good opportunity to um add a smoother surface along the edges uh, potentially i think that it's it's a it's a rough travel for for people using mobility devices. So I think that that's a, a thing that we could think about in the future is that you could widen the path on the side and create a pathway that was a little more ADA compliant possibly. Um, on the trees, I think that's the biggest concern that a lot of a lot of folks have is that um, beyond the grass, the grass is certainly a concern, but it does grow back and, and, and we've made good efforts there. But I think the trees are something that people are concerned about that we don't, we don't wanna lose mature trees. And we know that the, the soil getting comp compacted around those, those older trees can be a, a concern. Turn. So I don't know if anyone had any thoughts on, on mitigation efforts there. I think there was Darlene, you and I had a conversation around some things that could be done potentially to sort of fix some of the issues there. Just wanted to open up that conversation. And may I point out, uh, I was very pleased with Naomi's uh, presentation the other night, both at the Tree Commission and there at the Parks and Recreation Commission, in that she has set out a design that can be as the mature Norway maples are gonna come down because their age is coming. There's a pattern that can be pursued so that it's very simple to understand what the next replacement tree is gonna be on that side of the common or on that particular pathway. And that's nice because as you have the ability to replenish your uh, funds due to you know, activities on the common, You'll know what to do to set aside, you know, we can, we're going to pick off two more trees this spring or something like that. And that so that you stay on top of it and we don't develop what we have right now, which is a lot of big uh, gaps, uh, particularly like along on the hotel side. Although that is being addressed in the spring planting program. Have, have all of you seen the design? I don't know if it's of interest to you. Do you want to see it? I, don't have I, I have seen it and I think it's lovely. Um, I think it's, it's, I think Naomi knows what she's doing and it's, um, it's exciting to take a long-term view of where we're going next. Um, yeah. I was saying, if you want to e email that over to me, darling, I'd be happy to share it out to the, to the group here today. I can't sh share my screen. Oh yeah. If you, if you have something you want to share, that would be fine as well. I, I don't do it very often, but there it is right there. So if that works. Now, is that, is that visible to you folks yep. or not? Uh, is it big enough? Looks good to me. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, there you go. So the, this is, as we all know, is the circular entrance area down by the hotel, which is along here. The biggest number of gaps is along this side of the um, common. And so this, the UA is, uh, um, it's elms. Uh, there are two different types of elm trees that are going to be introduced. And there, the elms are going to be on the outside. They'll be four this time around. And there'll be, uh, looks like another four of a different species, a swamp um, maple, I believe. And over here, we have the beginning of what's going to be the, re the future replacement on this side of the uh, common. It'll start with three of these London plane trees. Now, I never liked London plane trees until I went down to Philadelphia and saw them as the courtyard trees for Constitution Hall. And they're very interesting in dark environments. They almost have this luminescent ability to lighten the environment. So that sort of sets a path there. Um, these trees I have not memorized, but you'll notice there's two on one side of the path and two on the other side. And that gives, it starts the sense of creating a, an alley. And you can fill those in over time. Um, that's actually a, an NS is a black tuplo, I think. Yes, black tuplo. And then what's really being built up since we can't do anything down uh, at the actual uh, entrance way, that's going to just have to stay with the plans that you folks are doing in this discussion. The area around the Washington Arch is going to be given some more uh, effect. 
the, there's a row that already exists of elm trees, but there's one that's missing. So this will, will complete the set of four. And then there will be, I think the final decision was it was going to be fringe trees, which are a flowering tree for spring drama. And that will heighten the view for the Washington um, archway. Now, something that some people weren't totally comfortable with, but you have to start this type of thing early. We have very little space in Salem where we have enough um, soil to really get huge, attractive, 100 year old trees. And the common is one of those places. So there's going to be two specimen trees laid out. This probably is actually gonna move on this side of the pathways. That was something that was decided uh, at the Parks and Rec Commission meeting. And then that one is going to be a, I think it's a chestnut. There were some changes met. So whatever was said um, on this map doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be, but it's gonna be a tulip tree and a chestnut tree. And this one will be closer here. So these will have full sunlight, enough room, enough space, enough air. They will become the destination trees on a hot day when you can still hear the music, but you need a little more shade, you'll move into the shade that's been cast on the lawn. And the nice thing is that there's, uh, if, there, if things price out well, there will be uh, two designated additional trees to fill in a gap that's over there by the John Bertrand home. So I, what I like about this is you can foresee where the gaps get filled in uh, over time as natural events take place with our trees, which we just have to expect. So I'm, I really think that she did an excellent job. I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to being an old man sitting under those trees someday. <laughs> uh, but this is very, yeah, this is, this is good stuff. And it's good to see more variety for sure on the common. Um, you and I had talked about, uh, I don't remember the word aeration of the, the tree roots after October. Is that something that, I don't know how that's been priced out or is that something that we've looked into as a city? Uh, I'm not necessarily yeah. asking you that, Darlene. I know, I know we, we spoke about it. I don't know if, 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 if you've spoken to Ellen about it or to others or if this is something as a city. Yeah, we no, that was just you and me. I mean, I do want everybody to know that the Tree Commission website has lots of videos on it now for reference purposes. And we're just now finishing up a uh, review of our tree manual, which has a lot of information that's useful. But if people want to visit, um, it's, there's a quick link section that's on the right-hand side left-hand side, a white box, and it's got a number of uh, videos that talk about this issue of compaction and trees being planted too deeply or covered up with mulch. That is, uh, actually I spent six hours down on Riley Plaza today uh, exposing the roots of um, two trees. I've already worked on one, but uh, when you plant a tree too deeply, it suffocates and it starts sending up these roots that go around the trunk, it just, you know, it, it can't breathe, it's not getting nutrition and they just diminish over time. And we don't get the investment that we're putting into all these trees. So um, I think we've seen that as an issue and I think it's going to be addressed, but actual aeration, why don't we defer to what Ray and Dave think about that? Because that is an expense. Uh, and I don't know that we've ever thought about that. Abra, hey, Trish, are, are any of you able to speak yeah. to that, that topic? Uh, well, Darlene, could you take, um, do you mind taking the screen down just so I can see better? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, think, I think Ray and David addressed it a little bit earlier. Our plan is, is to, to do that a little bit um, with some of those trees in the front where, um, where it's really, really compacted. It is um, incredibly expensive. It is not something that you could do yearly. Um, geez, off the top of my head, I can't remember how much the willows cost Ray to you, but it was two trees and it was a pretty significant amount of money. It was, yes, ma'am. It was, it was close to about 20 for about two trees. So $10,000 each tree. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, 20,000 per tree. That's what, that's what the willows cost, ma'am. I can't, I can't sit there and say that. So it was about 10,000 for 10, both of those trees. 10,000 each tree. Is yes, 10,000 each tree for a total of 20. Yes, ma'am. 
Councilor Watsonfeld. Thanks, and I, I mean absolutely no offense to any of the experts on this call when I ask this question, but I just feel compelled to say out loud, with Naomi's work and the installation of the trees and everything going on and some of the plans that David shared, I just wanted to say, I assume you all are working on timing and everything. If we are adding a width to two cross paths from, what is it, five feet to 12, that's a substantive difference. So I would hope that any trees going in around those areas would be offset to accommodate the widening of those paths for when the time comes, right? Okay, yeah, just, I know. And again, Thanks, I mean, Karen. no offense. I, just, I mean, no offense. I, assume I that's think the case. that's one of the, <laughs> that was the major reason. I think that I, I, I didn't hear I, last night, but I think that that, that chestnuts tree um, that was um, placed, um, I don't know if it was getting X'd off or moved somewhere else, but um, mm. that was the first thing that, that I saw when I looked at that, because um, I think that that is going to interfere with, um, mm -hmm. with some of the path widening. Yeah, the other, th the other comments that came up is um, that they do, they do like the open space in the middle and would like to primarily keep that. Um, you know, with with spotting a large century tree, which which will be really different and beautiful, will be great. But you know, just not smacked in the middle where um, we still want to have that kind of open, common feel. Um, so yeah. And uh, to to piggyback on that just a little bit, just in general, we try very hard to keep um, most of the events you know, more towards the, um, I, I would say that kind of the business section um, of the common in the front. Um, so, you know, even when we do have, you know, whatever it is, food trucks, 75 vendors, or um, whatever, there's still, um, there's still open space that, um, that we haven't touched, um, that, it, you know, that is still available. Um, for people to use and enjoy. Thanks, Ellen. One last request, uh, Chair Hapworth, would it be possible for um, Dave to, David to send around that, um, the plan that he showed on his on our screen earlier? Do you mind making that request? Thank you. I'll send that to, to, to Ty. And you can... I'll, I'll, put that, I'll put that in the share drive and anybody who needs it, happy to send it over to you yeah. as well. But I just to, to kind of give a um, disclaimer too. I mean, this is just a working plan. Um, you know, uh, so nothing nothing has been finalized. They're just things that we looked at and put on to one sheet um, in preparing for this meeting. Um, so I don't I don't want anybody to think that um, you know what's here is car is carved in stone. Um, we don't know what we can and we can't do um, for you know a myriad of reasons. Major, major is is budget, obviously. Council Watson, do you have another comment or question? I do. I have one more question, Councilor Hapworth, and I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, with regards to the to the um, damage mitigating pads that we discussed earlier, it, I guess my question is, what are the next steps and how, what does the timing look like? Because I think since, you know, if, if we reflect back on Mr. Hanscom's petition, it is with regards to, you know, some level of protection prior to the fall event, you know, when October comes. And I know that the whole world is having supply chain issues right now and that there are really serious concerns around that. And of course, nothing moves quickly when we're talking about um, public funding. And so I was, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on, on timing. Um, hmm, I don't know which one I should answer. I guess it's still a little bit of a question mark, but I mean, with any of the, the state funded money that we may have coming towards us that are earmarked for the common that I had talked about earlier that would go to a permanent solution, um, that money doesn't have to, we can actually, spend that in advance of getting it. Somehow that's the only accounts um, financially that we're allowed to open up POs and, and start spending because those earmarked dollars, they only give us 50% upfront. 
and then the other 50% we, the city spend and then get reimbursed from the state. Um, so that is a special account that we are allowed to access that money pretty quickly. The Salem Common Revolving Fund, um, I have to present a letter to the council for approval to spend that money before I can open up a PO. Um, <clears throat> so the timing um, you know, is kind of dependent on if we have to go out to bid, depending on the project, and Dave can talk maybe a little bit more about that. We did talk about that widening of the path trying to happen, happen um, as soon as feasible, but it depends on contractors and, and all of that. So Dave, if you want to chat about that a little bit. Um, sure. sure. Yeah, it's a good question, Caroline. And um, right now, emphasis on right now, the, uh, the manufacturer or the, the company that we're looking for to, to purchase the pads from is saying about 16 to 20 days from the issuance of a PO to the shipping. So, you know, maybe consider a month's time once we get that, but it does take time to put the POs in place for those kind of things. But um, it's not it's not an extreme amount of time that's needed right now. Um, the concrete work, we actually have some on-call contractors that are doing different sidewalk improvements all throughout the city. And each one provided us with a cost for replacing, remo removing existing concrete and putting new concrete in. So it's just a matter of putting a task order and then scheduling them for that. So we don't think there's a, a huge lead time for any of those things. It's just a matter of getting the contractors identified and, and having them start the work. So what I hear you both saying, um, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, but it, we could have some real protections in place prior to Haunted Happenings, the launch of Haunted Happenings this year. I think, I think that's doable, yeah. Thank you. That was my last question, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any final uh, questions or comments before we open it up for public comment? Darlene? Just one last thing. So now that you have a definite uh, 12 foot uh, width for your, your cross paths, um, Trish, can you make sure that Naomi gets the drawings so that she knows her placements? Of course, she said that she'll be going to the common and putting stakes where the trees are gonna go. So all this can be physically mapped out and seen ahead of time. Yes, we, we, will, we will all be involved in the staking process and exactly where it will be. Sure, thank you. Uh, what, just out of curiosity, what, what material are we using for that? Uh, we mentioned those little circles in the, at the intersections to allow trucks to turn. Is this just regular poured concrete or is it matching what's there right now? It would be poured concrete. What, what is there right now? I just, I, I'm not sure that I've ever seen that material. It looks like a, some old and destructible kind of, I'm not sure what, what exactly the common paths are made out of. Is it's it just concrete? It, yeah, go ahead. No, no. That's washed concrete. Yeah, so the existing paths that we're gonna replace are all concrete. They're, they're five feet wide now, we're gonna make them 12. Yeah. I guess my, my question is, there's something different. The common paths are made out of something that's different and rougher. Um, right. so I'm curious if, that, if that's going to be something that looks, no, this is going to be a question we get for sure. So is, is it going to be something that matches what's what's on the paths around or is it, or is it going to be um, what we are see you, in our. Are you talking about the stone dust path? No, I'm talking that in the, the center paths that, that oh. look like they're made out of concrete with rocks in them to use a not scientific description. Alan, do you have? Yes, quick comment. Um, those are those are the historic um, concrete paths. So that's another issue again, just saying. Well, yeah, I guess the question you're asking Councillor Hapworth, if I if I hear you correctly, is what is the um, what is causing that texture? Is it like a is it like a stamp or is it a mix of stone or what? Why is there that texture? Yeah, and I guess my 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 understanding of of the plans here was that it was going to be, um, I guess, little circles added at each intersection there to allow turning. Yeah, we the entire path will get replaced. Yeah, we'll have to match in. So so a, a, a good distance of the existing path will, will have to be taken out when we make those transitions for the turning. But the um, the the concrete that's there now is is kind of it's called washed. The, the surface is washed a little bit, so it exposes some of the aggregate. And we can certainly do that with the new concrete so that it matches. 
Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments before we open it up? Is any members of the public that want to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand. We have Jen Santo from the Salem Common Neighborhood Association. I believe they have a statement. Jen, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Well, thank you, Ty. I just want to say thank you to everyone that's on this call tonight and everyone that's working really hard to make the common a better place. Um, I know I speak for the SCNA board and for Dennis who couldn't be with us tonight because he's on um, a meeting with Historic Salem for the arch that we're working so hard to to get going. Um, but again, just thank you everyone. Um, I think we all love our open space across the street and we want to keep it um, as nice as we can. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Liz, oh, let me, uh, sorry. Let me allow you to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Actually, Thank if you don't mind stating your name and address. It's Liz, Liz Aberg. I live on Forrester Street. I'm the treasurer of the Friends of the Salem Common. I, I um, want to um, echo Jen Santo how pleased the Friends are that this, this is um, up for discussion. It's a very informative meeting, and I'm really grateful to everyone for putting this together and for to give my thanks to Alan Hanscom, too for, I guess, initiating this discussion as a more of a public discussion. Um, thank you very much. It was very informative. Um, and we look forward to um, he, um, discussing further. Um, um, this is a great first step plan and thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And next we have uh, Zach Conter. Zach, if you wanna state your name and address for the record. Of course. Um... My name is Zach Counter. I live at 24 Carlton Street, and uh, I'm, I actually am very impressed with the amount of information that has been uh, coming out from today's here uh, today's hearing. I really uh, just joined the meeting because I saw the public notice regarding the uh, petition to ban vendors uh, categorically on the Salem Common, which I really strongly oppose. Um, I am frequently going through Salem Common at least twice a day. I'm uh, walking my dog through the park, you know, crisscross through it from the uh, basically the Witch Museum side all the way to the eastern portion. And, um, you know, one thing I really like about the, the Salem Common is just the sense of community that it brings. It doesn't just, you know, only belong to uh, one neighborhood, right? Like this is a uh, this is a, an area, an open area that belongs to uh, not even just the residents of Salem, but to the public at large. Um, I understand uh, Mr. Hanscom's concerns that he had regarding the uh, damage that was done to the to the common this past Halloween. I mean, I was one of the uh, local guys walking around and noticing all of the the mud tracking everywhere, especially since it was caused by the uh, a lot of the rain that had unfortunately occurred during uh, the Halloween weekend. And um, I know um, there might, there has to be ways to to mitigate the the type of uh, the damage that we saw. Uh, I'm very happy to hear about some of the plans that I wasn't expecting to hear today, such as like widening the uh, the paths. I'm going to be interested to see you know more about what those paths are are going to look like, or are they just going to be like any other cement sidewalk that uh, will we see around the uh, the city, or if they're going to be something a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. Um, but I mean, that's really all I, I had for a comment today, just uh, that I want to make sure that we keep uh, the, the common accessible, that we allow for the vendors. I mean, I love the food truck festival that happens every year. I think the Halloween carnival is a great thing for, uh, for kids. And, um, you know, it's kind of fun to have around for that, for that time period. Um, and that I don't want to see all of that go away to just turn the common into just one big green lawn that is just an extension of the uh, the abutters backyard. So thank you. Thank you, Zach. Councilor Watson, did you have a... I did. I, I, thanks, Chair Hapworth. I just wanted to um, pause right here for just a second and, and make some clarifying comments. So just as a reminder to everybody on um, from the public joining us tonight, Mr. Hanscom's petition was not a categorical ban of vendors 
for all time on the Salem Common. I think it's important to acknowledge that Mr. Hanskin's concerns were particularly about last year's damage and how we can protect the common for just the fall of 2022, just this year, um, to protect it and give it a chance to sort of bounce back, I think was, you know, not to put words in Mr. Hanscom's mouth, but the order is clearly stated as being a temporary um, ban for 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 the for this year. Um, and just just I don't think I think I just want to say I, I acknowledge as the Ward Two counselor that that the conversation around the use of the Salem Common is quite the hot button topic. And I um, and I think that. It's important to state that that we all, not all of us want the same thing, right? But I think most most of us all kind of want the same thing, which is that this 400 year old meeting space, communal meeting space, which is what it has always been since farmers brought animals to the swamp to eat the grass, right? Like that is what the common has always been. And I think that, um, I think we all agree. And I think that we all want to, ch we cherish it and we, we want to take care of it. Um, and I really, really understand and respect and appreciate the comments that have been shared today, especially from Mr. Counter uh, from, from Carlton Street. I think that's a, an excellent point, right? I think that sometimes it feels like who does the common belong to? Um, but, but I hope that this conversation tonight and, and Mr. Hanscom's petition really clarifies that, that a little bit, that, that we are all kind of on the same page here. I think that we just, we just want it to be taken care of and look good and stay healthy and be um, an asset for all of us um, and for our visitors moving forward. So I just wanted to clarify that point because I had heard it a couple of times today um, and I think it's an important distinction. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, yep, yeah. I'm sorry, I have, I need to remove some guests. <laughs> and then we have, I think one more public comment. Oops, here we go. Um, Brooke Zambroski. And I need to add Brooke. Hello, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, if you want to say your name and address for the record, please. Sure, I'm Brooke Zambroski Nagel, and I live at 35 Washington Square on the north side of the common. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for bringing so many great ideas to the table today. Um, and I wanted to mention that one of the reasons I love living on the common is the liveliness, um, that October brings and being able to share in the magic of it all. Um, I do recognize that it puts a big burden on the plants, the grass, um, and the general nature of the common. So I think it's great that we're talking about how to plan for future. Um, one thing I noticed was we had a lot of picnic tables grouped together, especially around the fair time, the kids fair. Um, and that was one of the hot spots for becoming a mud puddle. And then once the rain happened, people started avoiding the area altogether. Therefore, you know, the damage was not for nothing, but it wasn't as a space as utilized as it could have been. So in the future, potentially spreading the picnic tables out from more than just the one area could help alleviate some of the stress. Um, I know the south side of the common or where the playground is doesn't get the same kind of traffic and there are a few picnic tables there already, um, but maybe moving to other areas of the common so it can spread it out and share the load a little bit more would be helpful. But thank you all for looking into this and thanks for bringing the public in as well. Thank you, Brooke. And I think I, there we go. I think I've okay. Um, okay. Well, I want to thank everyone who expressed opinions here tonight. So we do need to take an action on on what we have in front of us here. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, just on on this uh, this petition, if I could just go first, it's um, I think for me, you know, as a as a as a common resident, I think I, I appreciate Alan for bringing bringing this forward. I think it's a, it's a it's a it's a worthwhile conversation to have about what's, you know, what, what the condition of our common is, what it looks like. Um, I wouldn't support uh, a ban on events in the common. I think that's something that it's, it's, it's an important part of our, of our city, of our, of our October plans. I think it's something that does belong to everybody. I think it's something that every year, it wouldn't be in October in Salem without all of us expressing some opinion about the common and how it's used. This is, this is an annual event for all of us. And 
Um, but I, but I think it's, it's, it's a, it, there are some worthwhile questions about, I mean, we all, we, we have mature trees in the common that we want to make sure are there for us. We, you just yesterday, I, my son and I were out playing soccer on the common. We, we use it as it's not our backyard for, to be clear, but, but a lot of us who live around here, who don't have a yard, we, we use it as our yard and we, we, we want it to be something that we can use the other 11 months out of the year, or even in October sometimes. Um, but we balance that with the needs of the city for sure on my, on my end. I think it would, from, if it were my opinion, I think I would, I would like to leave something like this in committee so that it's something we can come back to, um, not come back to necessarily to consider the ban, but to come back to just to discuss things that are happening on the common things that, you know, maintenance plans that we see if, if there's some sort of a concern that we run into, if there's bad weather, if there's some sort of a change we need to make and we want to discuss it in an open meeting fashion, I think, leaving this thing in committee until until the end of the year is that it'll it'll allow us to have it have it there if we want to bring it forward at any point um but open to other opinions Councillor watson felt thank you chair hapworth i agree with everything that you just said um my only additional comment would be that i understand contracts have been signed already for for the fall of 2022 as well. So legally speaking, the city would be in a, con a compromised situation if we were to take action um, and send this back to the council with a positive recommendation tonight. And the council would then choose you know, to, to implement um, the changes requested in the petition. I would, I would not wanna expose us in that way. Um, you know, business, it's business continues to move forward. And, um, and I think that this would not be the year, even if we wanted to do it this, at this point, this wouldn't be the year we could do it. Um, I think that I'm really heartened by a lot of the, of the plans for damage mitigation and the acknowledgement around like what everybody, what we all learned from last year and like what was new information. And, and, um, and I think that, I think that this has also, this conversation has brought a lot of light to the work the city is already doing, right? I think it's important to acknowledge that that the city um, has a maintenance plan, and that that I, I think that Alan's point um, is important to, that we do kind of we do have this a little bit of this cycle, right, year over year of sort of like putting money in, destroying it a little bit, putting money back in, like you know, and we want to kind of figure out how to move that needle forward for long term um, goals towards the common, which I I understand are happening, and I think it's great that it's happening, um, and I think that. Sometimes it just comes down to transparency in the process, right? So I want to thank Mr. Hanscom for um, for bringing forward the petition because it has brought public light to a lot of the work already being done, a lot of the planning, um, the efforts, and um, and the conversation is an important one. So so thanks. Sure, I think that's a, a great point. I think we as a, as a city, we one thing we do very well is we we learn from events that happen year after year. We do a good job of after action reviews and, and changing things up and making adjustments. Uh, Councilor Merkel. Thank you, Chair Hapworth. Uh, yes, I echo uh, both Councilor um, Hapworth and Councilor Watson Feltz, uh, uh, what they've said about acknowledging all the hard work that the city does, uh, not just for, for the common, but all our parks. It's, it's always, um, so telling to hear how much goes into the maintenance and, and what goes on here. Uh, and uh, I appreciate it as well. And I also appreciate Mr. Hanscom's um, uh, bringing this forth because as uh, Council Watson felt said, it's it started a great discussion and um, a great learning curve for me. And thank you for inviting me to the committee at this, this committee <laughs> meeting, not being my committee. I was really happy to get the invite today because this was this was absolutely terrific. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I support keeping this in committee as well for the, for the reasons uh, Council Watson felt set, uh, has already said. And it's definitely as you know, we looked at it, it's a working document uh, with, with the plans and, um, and moving forward with this. Uh, so I would like to uh, motion to keep this in committee. Thank you. Second. Okay. The motion from Councillor Merkel to leave this in committee, second by Councillor Watsonfeld. Uh, Councillor Watsonfeld. Yes. Councillor Merkel. Yes. And I'm a yes. So we have a vote of three nothing to leave this in committee. Um, I want to thank everybody who's here tonight and gave gave public comment. I will note that I accidentally removed two people from the meeting <laughs> and I apologize for that. I'm going to reach out to them personally. I, I was just intending to remove them from the ability to speak and not have them as panelists. Um, so I'll reach out to both Liz and I believe Zach, who I removed mistakenly. 
Um, I want to thank Al Alan for bringing this forward. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about this, to talk about some of the things that the city is doing here around the common. And then, and then, you know, Ellen and uh, Trish, Dave and Ray for the work that they're doing and others they're doing to, to just make this a good October. And thank Darlene for joining us and giving us some expertise around things happening around our trees. Uh, I guess I will take one. Thank well, that you. Was about... What to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll take one more motion. Motion, motion to adjourn. To adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Uh, Councilor Watsonfeld. Yes. Councilor Merkel. Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.